I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, how human humanity, humans have altered uh, the sort of ecology of the world and how this in turn has influenced sort of habitat and likelihood of human encounters with psychedelic plants and, and fungi. And those in turn, that's, it's an interesting link because psychedelic plants and fungi, um, when people take these things, it, it tends to put them in touch with nature in a very deep way, like on a very superficial level, your aesthetic appreciation for nature is massively enhanced and people tend to become more ecologically aware and concerned. And uh, this is quite, it's not just unique to psychedelics, other, other kind of mystical transcendent experiences like near-death experience, people c come back with an increased ecological concern. So it's a, it's a facet of a universal human transcendent mystical experience. And so we're kind of now in the, the Anthropocene, like the, the age of man. And this, this age is, is coinciding with the sixth great mass extinction of, of life on this planet. And uh, never ever before in the planet's history has, has one species wielded such an awesome and terrible power against all other life that, that shares this planet with us. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, like hu humanity is having a, a vast impact on the world in many, many different ways. So. Yeah, we're, we're, as a species goes, we're very, very good at bending nature and the world around us to, to our whims. It's one of our great, great powers and great powers of, of destruction. And one of the really sort of, I guess, major important events in human cultural evolution and history, in particular, I think, is our alliance with, with grasses, our domestication of grasses, like wheat, corn, maize, barley, oats, rice, uh, teff, all these grains we've been using for a very, very, very long time. And as you can see here, they, you know, there's been a lot of change. We've modified those grasses uh, to, to suit our nutritional needs. But more importantly, and something that's sometimes maybe overlooked, is it was a two-way domestication. So those, our domestication of these grasses and other crops domesticated us as well. Like before this time, we were, we were nomads and, and hunter-gatherers. We, we tended to live quite low population density, gathering and hunting what we could get from, from the environment. But this completely changed uh, the, the future of, of human civilization. For the first time in human history, people started being able to live together in larger numbers in cities because they had dependable food which they, they grew. And from that, uh, culture, and, and religion and like many, many things. Suddenly we had more time on our hands to sort of contemplate the meaning of life and that's, that's one of the very, I think, biggest events was, the take, was our alliance domestication of grasses in particular. Like every bit as big, if not bigger, than our discovery of fire. Like it's a really major event in, in human civilization. So yeah, so like Psychedelics and the ecological movement sort of really got going in the 60s. The publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring about the effect of pesticides on the environment, but also people were experimenting with uh, psychedelics at the time. Like, this isn't particularly in reference to like, e ecological concern, like bombing, particularly nuclear bombing, is definitely not an ecological kind of activity. But um, uh, during the 60s, there was a lot of cultural ferment and like, lots of movements were being kind of ignited and going. And the green movement was one of those. People were taking psychedelics and wanting to sort of enact change in what they saw was wrong in the world. And so, yeah, just a little bit of cultural history on that. So in 1966, uh, then Mary Praxter, Stuart, Stuart Brand, had an LSD trip and figured, like, why we've gone to space why do we not have any photos of the Earth from space yet? Why has nobody done that? And like, so two years, so he sent out a massive campaign, he sent all these badges out saying, why is there not a picture of the whole Earth from space? And he sent out this big campaign after this, this trip. And two years later, in 1968, the Apollo 8 astronauts took, took some photos, including this one, which is like a really, really pretty, probably one of the most profound, amazing photos ever, ever taken, because it was like, a testament to kind of how far we've come in some ways, like being able to look at our planet from the outside. Um, 
is a pretty amazing, amazing achievement. And this became a very powerful symbol of the, the green ecological movement. And the year after this photo was taken, uh, World, World Peace Day uh, was founded. So, yeah, and I never sort of important thing. Um, two, two sort of philosophers, Arne, Arne Nies and John Seed, uh, came up with this concept of deep ecology. And LSD was very influential on their, their thinking. Um, and so deep ecology is the appreciation of, of life in all its forms and it has an inher inherent value beyond human needs. And so, and from stemming from that, living in an equilibrium with, with that in mind. So this goes very much against like, you know, the sort of Ar Abrahamic religious view that like man has soul nature is without soul and is effectively there to be used, exploited how we see fit. And I think this kind of hangover now that we have from this still is one of the reasons we're in this kind of ecological, uh, and at a time of ecological con concern. And yeah, like another bit, another sort of bit of interesting cultural history. So uh, John, John P. Allen, who's one of the main guys behind B the Biosphere 2 project, which is the largest E e ecological experiment and sort of semi self sustaining ecosystem in the world, an amazing feat of engineering. John, John had a peyote trip, trip with the experience with the Hoochal Indians, and uh, it inspired him to sort of want to, to yeah, to build this. Uh, he had this vision and he wanted to sort of build it and make it a reality. Mark Van Tiele was one of the engineers who worked on the system, so he had experiences with psychedelics and he wanted to, to bridge. Um, technology with ecology. He saw them as one of the, the same. People say, some people say technology is what could kill us, but it's just, it's purely the intent of how it's used. It can be used for great good as well. So yeah, um, plants and fungi, um, they can't run away from things to defend themselves. So they've become masters, master chemical alchemists and produce all manner of different different very potent molecules. And as you see here, some of these are like serotonin, pinaline, melatonin are natural endogenous compounds, as, as is DMT. Silicin, harmaline are, are plant and fungi based compounds, but you can see how similar they are to our natural endogenous brain chemistry. So these plants and fungi have a way of hacking uh, our nervous systems. And yeah, and it's important again to just state that experiencing, experience with these compounds, it tends to elicit this all-encompassing oneness with the world and uh, appreciation for, for nature. Um, so yeah, to, as a little just preamble for what I'm going to talk about, because it might seem a little bit kind of far out in some respects, but um, this, this is a cordyceps fungus which has infected an ant. So what happens there, an ant gets infected with the spores of this fungus and the, the, the fungus takes control over the, the nervous system of this ant and makes it climb very high and, and, and it makes the ant bite, bite down. So if another ant dis discovers one of these ants acting strange, it will grab it and get it as far away from the colony as it can because the fungus is telling this ant to go up high, lock itself in and then it will produce the fruiting bodies and put these spores out for maximum dispersion because it's high up. Uh, so it, it's testament to how a very fungi, supposedly very simple organisms, they can wrest control of a much more complex being and bend them to their whims, uh, against, fully against their will. So a lot of these plants and fungi, they, they sort of tend to be like, surprisingly invasive. It's worth bearing in mind when people tend to ingest them, they tend to sort of produce these ecologically oriented experiences, but you tend to get these plants and fungi thriving in areas of ecological uh, damage and disturbance. So it's an interesting kind of double-edged thing going on here. So Phragmites, uh, the common reed, is, uh, has DMT and 5-MeO DMT, and it's incredibly invasive in much of the world. 
um, and it's quite, it's quite a problem, as is Phalaris grass as well in some parts of the world is loaded with DMT and 5-meo DMT and grasses have this ability, once they sort of get locked into an area, they're, they're very hard to suppress. Um, no, no group of organisms though has probably done better than fungi um, out of their sort of alliance with, with humans. So mycologist Paul Stamets calls fungi like these uh, anthropophilic, so very much liking of, of man. So you have Silocybe tubensis, which has got a very widespread mushroom. It's so widespread in the tropics and the subtropics, we don't really know where its, its native range is. And it's spread all over the world in tropical, subtropical zones on, on bovine dung, on our cattle. So it's done very well out of us. And we've created these pasturelands for our cattle, which will be relevant sort of later. Paniolus mushrooms have done the same. Uh, they do very well on bovine dung, and they're some of the most potent mushrooms uh, known. Same with the wood-loving fungi. Uh, very, very potent mushrooms. Before probably occupying quite niche, niche uh, habitats, but because of forestry, because of wood chipping, because of people deliberately seeding beds, they are, they're thriving and they're, they're, they're spreading to other parts of the world well, well beyond their natural ranges um, and do very well off their alliance with man. Same liberty caps um, and Silocide mexicana, which is kind of like the Mexican uh, equivalent to a liberty cap and a very important mushroom uh, to, to the Aztecs and to the Mazatec and other tribes still using them today. And they are both pasture mushrooms. So they, they like the pastures we've created for our sheep and our, our animals to graze there. So they've also benefited uh, through, through an alliance with man. And then, yes, yeah, so, so this is ergot. This is an ergot fungus. So whereas liberty caps, they form this parasitic mycelium that integrates with grass roots, this fungus lives on the heads of grasses like rye, like wheat. And it's from ergot, which LSD was, was derived. And it's very unlikely we would have encountered that were it not for our domestication and close alliance with, with rye. Um, yeah, fly agaric mushrooms, their Amanita muscaria, are very, very ancient shamanic uh, hallucinogen. They are, they're considered now a cosmopolitan species. They've spread all over the world, temperate zones of the world because of forestry. They form uh, mycorrhizal alliances with birch, with many different pines, and they've spread all over the world uh, due to an alliance with, with us. And yeah, th these two plants, um, so, so yeah, the morning glories are a really nice plant. They're, they're considered a, no a noxious weed, but like, uh, if you think about it, like, what does that make us? <laughs> um, they've spread into many parts of the tropics, and they're loaded with lysergic acid amides, so like sort of natural LSD equivalents. And same Hawaiian baby wood roses. Uh, no actual, I don't think, shamanic use of these, but it's been discovered they're also loaded with lysergic acid amides. And these are two very invasive groups of plants that are spreading in Hawaii and much of the tropical regions. I was just been out in Ethiopia and I saw these uh, growing, growing rampant there. And then, yes, yeah, Salvia divinorum is a very strange plant in many ways. I mean, it's considered uh, like an atypical psychedelic, which in other words means it's very, very weird. And <laughs> nobody really knows sort of where it, where it came from. It, it seems to live, it's very rare. So it lives in a few sort of ravines in, in Mexico, in central Mexico. And there's a few theories. Some people think it might be a cultigen of two different plants because it, doesn't re it very rarely produces fertile seeds. And sort of it grows and then falls over and then grows. It's, it's got quite a strange life cycle. And yeah, we don't really know what's going on with it. It's a very strange one, but it's done very well through its alliance with man. Like the Mazatec Indians who use it, they say it's, it's not from there and it came from somewhere else, but no one knows where the hell it came from. Uh, so it's a strange one. And these are just a, fruit, a few species that, that are considered ruderal species. So these are, these are plants that do very well in disturbed soils and areas around, around man. And uh, yeah, cannabis, Syrian rue, nicot tobacco species that are all very important shamanic herbs uh, in different parts of the world. 
And then, yeah, some very potent uh, DMT-containing plants. So acacia confusers growing uh, sort of rampant now in Hawaii and become a very invasive species there. Mimosa uh, has high DMT levels in its root bark of about 1%. And uh, it's growing rampant now in parts of the southern US as a highly invasive species. Apparently, I've heard, I haven't got many good sources, but the ayahuasca vine has been planted in Bali and um, uh, somewhere else, Hawaii again. And apparently now it's growing wild in Hawaii and gone feral, uh, which is quite interesting. It seems like, although there's a lot of harvesting of ayahuasca going on, it seems like it's kind of got its, got its place secured because it is expanding its, its range now. And then it gets a bit more interesting with the whole, on the whole ayahuasca side of things according to Amazonian tales. So, the, you know, if you ask the Indians, if anthropologists ask the Indians, where did you get your knowledge of ayahuasca from? Out of the tens of thousands of Amazonian plants, how the hell did you figure out combining those two to produce the magic? And they say uh, that the plants told them to do it in the first place. And then it gets sort of stranger, like the uh, Kashinara tribe, the, uh, they use a f this, this amazing tree frog uh, and the secretions from it, Cambo, uh, Sapo. In their, as, a, as a medicine and curative agent and if you ask them where they got that idea from the shaman of the tribe at the time he said he, he drank ayahuasca and his tribe were ill and he, he asked the ayahuasca I need a way of healing my tribe and the, the great spirit of ayahuasca showed the shaman this particular tree frog and there's a lot of tree frogs in the Amazon uh, so that was kind of interesting yeah this is a, just a nice line from um, from Dennis McKenna when he had his first, uh, well, first big ayahuasca ceremony uh, experience. This is what the ayahuasca told him. He heard a voice over his left shoulder and he, he felt this voice kind of like represented the, the sum total of the, of the biosphere. Um, and that's a, I think it's a good, I think it, that's a good message. I think these plants can kind of humble us and sort of connect us and yeah, um, yeah, have some really good, important contributions to make to, to human life. Um, and we kind of, yeah, I think this, this connection uh, to things, to, to life, that these, that these plants, these fungi can sort of gift us is a really important thing. We need to kind of, yeah, we need to kind of wake up and like kind of look after the earth because it's not just good for it's not just good for for the earth, but it's good for us too. Like de, you know, depression is in Western society. Depression, I think it's got strikes about 20% of people, and it's on the rise. And it's you know it takes massive personal toll and economic toll. And my my perception on the depression thing is it's a symptom of Western society, uh, consumerism, materialism, lack of connection to, to nature. Um, so like these, I think what these psychedelics can do in a very powerful way, I think that maybe freaks some people out, is connect us back with nature and cut through this material stuff that's not really that important at all. And I think we kind of really need that. Uh, there's more and more people wanting more and more stuff and we kind of need to, need to assess, reassess our priorities and I think these things can really help us do that. Yeah, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.